This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Rollback rally, word of potential easing of tariffs between China and the U.S. and the Dow and the S&P to finally new records. Mighty Mouse, Disney fires on all cylinders in the latest quarter. And with its streaming service just days away, can the mouse continue to roar? And home buyer hesitation, why more people are feeling the need to hold off on buying that new home. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, November 7th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It was another record day for stocks. The catalyst word that the two largest economies wrapped up in a trade war have agreed to roll back their existing tariffs. The market may have interpreted that news as meaning the U.S. and China are closer to finalizing phase one of a trade deal. Eunice Yoon is in Beijing for us tonight. says the two sides have agreed in principle to roll back some of the existing tariffs in phases. The Commerce Ministry said that the negotiators have been discussing this for the past two weeks. And the ministry stressed that for a phase one agreement to be reached, some of the additional tariffs have to go. Beijing wants the tariffs to be lifted at the same time by the same amount, though how much could be negotiated. And the spokesperson said that the time and place of a deal signing has yet to be decided. After the Commerce Ministry's remarks, the state media has been laser focused on the point that if tariffs are not removed, there is no deal. That's been one of Beijing's core demands. The papers also emphasize that tariffs need to be lifted simultaneously, an indication to the Chinese that China and the U.S. are considered equals. Perhaps as a way to make it easier for the Trump administration to meet Beijing's demands, Chinese authorities jailed nine people today, including one with a suspended death sentence for smuggling the opioid fentanyl into the United States. China's Narcotics Commission worked with U.S. law enforcement in what Beijing says is the first such collaboration. The talk is that President Trump could use the outcome as political cover to lift tariffs, easing criticism that he's caving to Beijing, and is a sign that this could have been a calculated move with the trade talks in mind. The commission said that the decision was made in accordance with the consensus reached between President Xi and President Trump. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. Now, there was a report late in the day that the plan to roll back those tariffs faces strong internal opposition in the White House and that no final decision has been made. But that wasn't enough to derail stocks today. The Dow rose another 182 points. We're now at 27,674. Nasdaq rose 23 and did hit an intraday high. The S&P added eight points at the close for a record there. Bob Pisani has more on the day's action. Stocks continued their record run on Wall Street, but ended well off of the session highs. The markets rallied right out of the gate, first on word from Chinese officials that the U.S. and China would both begin to roll back existing tariffs and phases, and then took another leg higher once sources inside the Trump administration reiterated that same report. Now, by the close, <laughs> this is the problem, stocks slipped on a Reuters report saying the plan faces fierce internal opposition at the White House and no final decision has been made. You see how tough it is figuring out what's going on with tariffs. Still, big breakouts in trade-sensitive sectors helped fuel the record run today. We had 52-week highs in industrial stocks, material stocks, financials, and technology stocks. Bank stocks in particular rode the rally to new highs because of a big spike in bond yields. The yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury note spiked to its highest level since August, having its biggest move in terms of basis points since right after the 2016 presidential election. On the flip side, more defensive, rate-sensitive groups, your real estate, utilities, consumer staples, they lag behind. That's been the story all November. Home-building stocks in particular, Lennar, Pulte, D.R. Horton, they all sank 2 to 4 percent. Homebuilders have had stellar year, though. The yield move could be a big deal for the markets because it might, might signal a further shift out of bonds and back into stocks. That would certainly put some real legs under this rally. We'll see. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. With the launch of its streaming service just days away, Disney's quarterly results topped Wall Street estimates thanks to the box office success of The Lion King and more growth at its theme parks. Earnings beat expectations by 12 cents a share. And here's a big number. The company's revenue for the quarter rose 34 percent to $19 billion. Disney initially rose more than 4 percent following the news. Julia Borston has the key takeaway for investors. 
Walt Disney beat expectations across the board. The biggest takeaway from my exclusive interview with Disney CEO Bob Iger is what's ahead for the company's streaming business with Disney Plus launching Tuesday. Iger announcing that Disney Plus has new distribution partners to help expand its potential reach. We've uh, distribution deals with a number of different entities. Uh, we're pleased to announce today a deal with Amazon. Uh, we have deals with Apple, we have deals with Samsung, with Microsoft, with uh, LG, with Google. So significant, significant uh, you know, progress in terms of distribution deals and Amazon being the latest one. Iger also announcing that premium cable channel FX will have a big presence on Hulu. They're creating a destination on Hulu for shows from FX's cable network as well as originals from FX creators. Iger says this will add a lot of value to Hulu, which could drive subscriber growth. Iger wouldn't give any updates on subscriber additions for Disney+, Plus, but he says they're pleased with testing and ready to launch. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Burbank, California. Let's turn now to Dave Hager for more on Disney's earnings beat. He's senior media analyst at Edward Jones. Dave, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good afternoon. Clearly, they're having a good year, especially at the box office. Do you think they can continue this momentum? Uh, well, certainly, yeah, the, the company's been having a great year at the box office, and it looks like the current quarter is going to continue that with the new edition of uh, the Star Wars movies coming out, plus we have the, the Frozen 2 uh, sequel coming out as well. So it looks like in the near term, uh, we'll continue to see strength of the studios. Uh, then it's going to be a question of the other parts of the business, such as the parks continuing to grow, uh, and then even the, the media business staying relatively steady uh, in the near term. What about parks? Because they did report really solid results in their parks business, and they've been raising ticket prices, so they clearly have pricing power. Yes, they, they certainly do appear to have pricing power, and um, we, we expect there, there could be some uh, uplift in attendance, especially here in the U.S. Uh, with the Star Wars Galaxy Edge attractions have rolled out both in California and in um, Florida, and there's um, still more to come on that. Uh, the company had talked about uh, California has a larger area of that attraction opening up uh, next month, and then uh, Disney World in Florida has the same happening in, in January. So we feel like that, that should help drive additional growth. As it sounds like some people have actually been holding off on visiting those attractions until they're really fully open. Right. And, of course, a lot is riding on Disney+. Plus. Um, it's a money loser to begin with. How soon do you think before it starts to contribute to their top and bottom line? It, it looks like it, it will really be several years before that starts to actually contribute on the bottom line. Certainly from a top line revenue point of view, Disney Plus, we expect, will start contributing pretty quickly. Uh, the, the company looks like it's going to get a, a running start with their relationship with Verizon. And uh, then, you know, come March, they'll start rolling out more countries in, in Europe. So, uh, you know, the revenue ramp up should start occurring pretty quickly, but there's a lot of expense associated with um, the investment in content and in uh, getting the business uh, up and running. So it'll still be several years before we expect it to contribute to the bottom line. Dave Hager with Edward Jones. Again, thanks for joining us tonight, Dave. Thank you. And with Disney's new streaming service, Disney Plus days away from joining the long list of the other subscri subscription services, is it best for you to keep your current bundle or should you unbundle? That is the question. Tuna Amobi, senior media and entertainment analyst at CFRA Research, joins us now to talk about that. Good to see you, Tuna. Welcome back. Thanks, Sue. You Good say, afternoon. You say that the bottom line is bundling is not going to go away. Why? I think uh, it's hard to, um, you know, kind of imagine a scenario where, um, you know, the traditional bundle as we know it today is going to go away uh, just simply because it's hard to replicate uh, that synthetic bundle with the streaming offerings. What you're likely to see is consumers becoming more and more, you know, selective and focusing on those um, uh, services that they watch the most um, and also keep in mind that. Uh, most of the offerings today that we have are actually not offering live television, so a lot of on-demand content, uh, sports, et cetera. Uh, right. You have uh, hybrid services like Hulu. So I think you're going to see more and more, um, you know, kind of a shift towards uh, these newer offerings, but not necessarily fully replicate the traditional bundle. 
Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, made an interesting point. He was a, a, a speaker at yesterday's New York Times Deal Book Conference, and he was asked about all the competition out there uh, in streaming and otherwise. And here's what he said. Listen to this. People will subscribe to a couple services the way that they subscribe to a couple news services. Um, but then in terms of time, that's the real competition. The tricky thing in this streaming war is, you know, Apple and <clears throat> uh, Disney's not going to break out revenue for the service. And you'll hear some subscriber numbers, but you can just bundle things in, so that's not going to be that relevant. So the real measurement will be time, how do consumers vote um, with their evenings, and do they end up watching uh, what mix of all the services. You know, we focus so much on price and whether people want to unbundle because of the, the high price of bundling at this point. But will people have enough time to watch all that they can subscribe to? He makes a good point, don't you think? It does. <clears throat> Actually, it was uh, making a lot of sense. Um, you know, time is always going to be a constraint. Um, but I don't think that with the pricing that we've seen for some of these services, um, I think it really affords the consumer the option to um, kind of, uh, you know, pick and choose and actually to mix it up. We can foresee people subscribing to anywhere from four to six offerings and still be significantly where the price of the traditional bundle is today. What they gain is the ability to, in, in some ways, create their own synth synthetic bundle. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're also able to significantly save um, from what they're paying today. A lot of those trends are also secular, broadband growth and uh, international markets as right. well. That's why you see a lot of companies uh, looking internationally where those trends are just in the early innings. What, from what we see now, which companies do you think will be the winners and which have more challenges? Sue, so I think the way that we like to frame this streaming war is not necessarily playing out in one big battle. Uh, we see um, potential winners and losers across various fronts where we're seeing, for example, subscription uh, video on demand where Disney is a player as well as Netflix. Uh, we pick them in that category. The sports, of course, G Disney is going to uh, be very formidable. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, other areas like, uh, be, you know, hardware and streaming hub, have the likes of Roku. Um, and even Comcast playing okay. in the uh, uh, advertising space, uh, AVOD, and, and might be a player as well. So it's going to be compartmentalized uh, streaming wars is what we like to think about that. Tuna, thank you very much. Tuna Amobi with CFRA Research. Thank you. And coming up, home buyer confidence is starting to buckle. We're going to tell you why more people think this might not be the time to buy a home. Shares of Toyota climbed to a four-year high as the Japanese automaker posted better-than-expected quarterly earnings. More importantly, unlike other Japanese automakers, Toyota is not cutting its profit outlook. Phil LeBeau tells us why. With Americans driving more pickups and SUVs, these are tricky times for Japanese automakers, who still sell a sizable number of cars. But Toyota has been able to ride out the shifting tastes of Americans thanks to a full lineup of trucks and SUVs. That helped the automaker post better than expected earnings for the most recent quarter, with global revenue rising almost 5%. More importantly, Toyota has not lowered its full year profit forecast, as have other automakers. Meanwhile, Toyota is partnering with China's BYD, which makes electric cars and buses. The two firms will work on developing EVs. While Toyota pioneered hybrid cars with the Prius, it has not been a leader in pure electric vehicles. And as Tesla has grown its sales, with a plant in China about to start production, Toyota CEO Akio Toyota is now pushing his company to become more aggressive when it comes to electric vehicles. Meanwhile, Toyota is looking to grow its pickup sales here in the U.S. with a new plant about to begin production in Mexico. That will provide Toyota dealers here in the U.S. with more Tacoma pickups as they look to increase sales of trucks here in this country. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago.
No celebration for Party City, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The retailer's results missed on both profits and sales, and it cut its full year forecast for a second time this year. Party City also cited helium shortages and fewer Halloween shoppers in its stores as major headwinds. And look at that. The stock lost more than two-thirds of its value today, ending at just $2 even. That's an all-time low. Ralph Lauren saw strong growth though in China for its polo shirts and tweed jackets, and that helped the retailer top estimates. The company also said it's raising prices to help offset rising costs from tariffs on Chinese imports. Shares spiked more than 14.5% today to 115.67. And Teva Pharmaceuticals posted mixed results. It topped revenue forecasts, but slightly missed on earnings. The drug maker also raised the lower end of its full year forecasts. Separately, the CEO said today that the opioid-related litigation against Teva could be resolved by the end of this year. Shares rose more than 4.5% to 8.47. And then after the bell, Booking Holdings, which used to be called Priceline, they reported better than expected earnings but came up shy on revenue. Shares of the travel reservation company were volatile in after-hours trading tonight. They closed the regular session down more than 8% to 1849.93. Also after the bell, Activision Blizzard posted results that beat estimates thanks to the recent launch of its Call of Duty games. But the video game maker sees revenue in the holiday quarter below estimates due to increased competition from online and free-to-play games. Shares were volatile after hours. They closed the regular session down more than 3 percent to 54.55. GAP's CEO Art Peck will be stepping down. The board's current non-executive chairman will be taking over the reins of the company for the time being. Separately, GAP says its comparable sales were down in its third quarter. GAP shares initially fell sharply following the after-hours news. They closed the regular session up nearly 2 percent to 1806. And Zillow's revenue topped expectations driven by the real estate website selling more homes and growth in its advertising platform. Shares initially rose after hours trading, but closed the regular session down a fraction to 33.44. Meanwhile, mortgage rates moved higher today as the bond market sold off. Just more bad news for home buyers who are already losing confidence in the housing market. Diana Olick has more. Demand for housing is strong, but a shrinking share of Americans think now is the right time to buy. That according to a new survey from Fannie Mae. It found just 21 percent of people said now is the time to sign on the line. That's down from 28 percent in September. Why? Probably because of another data point in the survey. Fewer people say their household income is higher than it was a year ago. Just 16 percent, down from 21 percent in September. Affordability is front and center, and it's getting worse. The main source of the affordability problem is the lack of entry-level housing because boomers are not moving, Gen Xers are not moving, and builders typically build for the move-up buyer. So the biggest affordability issue is simply lack of supply. Home prices, which had been cooling off, turned hotter in the last month due to that severe shortage of homes for sale. The realtors reported a nearly 3 percent annual drop in inventory at the end of September. But the drop is far more on the low end of the market. For homes priced between one and $200,000, it's down 13 percent from a year ago. And that's the range where most first-time buyers live. Our data on first-time homebuyers shows they're being the most conservative in terms of the share of their income they'll dedicate to housing of several generations. Mortgage rates should be helping, but they actually ticked back up in September and jumped again today. Current buyers have very little wiggle room in their wallets, and even small rate moves matter, not only in affordability, but in the ability to qualify for a mortgage. Fewer people think rates will go down further, according to the Fannie Mae survey. And adding to the supply pressure, fewer people think now is a good time to sell a home, too. That's why more people are staying in their homes longer, five years longer than they were just a decade ago. And the longer they stay, the less homes there are for sale. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Let's turn now to Daryl Fairweather to talk more about the housing market and if you should be buying now or waiting until spring. Daryl's chief economist at Redfin. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. I know you agree that affordability is the biggest issue facing the housing market right now, but do you see any relief coming in that regard going into the new year? Well, 2019 
uh, buyers still have a lot of challenges out there when it comes to affordability. Rates came down and the market slowed down a bit this year, which gave buyers a better opportunity than they saw in 2018 or 2017. They're facing fewer bidding wars, but the underlying problem is still prices. And what about mortgage rates? We saw them tick up today, but historically they're still really low. But consumers seem to be extremely sensitive to those small, small variations. Mortgage rates are low from a historical perspective. I mean, anytime they tick up or down, it does impact how much you're paying every single month. But I think most buyers are looking for a, a home in their price range, one where they can afford the down payment. And that matters a lot more than just the monthly mortgage payment changing by a few dollars. Supply is, of course, a big issue. Home builders have been uh, re reticent about uh, building new homes. But I was reading that uh, for the first time in a while, home building contributed to GDP numbers uh, in our economy. That has to provide some hope, doesn't it? Do you think that's the beginning of a trend? That's right. Home builders pay attention to interest rates, too. And when interest rates come down, they can afford to build more. So that's definitely good news. Unfortunately, we have a really big housing shortage here in the U.S. that's even larger in places like California and other expensive coastal metros. So I think it's going to be a long time before building really puts a dent in home affordability. So what's your take for those who are sitting there saying, well, I don't know, is this a good time to go out and buy a house? or should I wait for the traditionally stronger spring selling season? It really depends on your personal situation. I think right now it is a good time to buy a home. Compared to next year, there might be even more competition. Prices might be even higher. So I wouldn't advise anyone to wait thinking that they're going to get a better deal later on. With this housing market and the lack of supply of homes, I only see prices going up. Daryl Fairweather with Redfin. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Up next, how about a nice cup of coffee without the coffee? Coffee comes in a lot of forms, hot, cold, flavored, but have you ever heard of coffee made without coffee beans? I'm Kate Rogers in Seattle, and tonight on Nightly Business Report, we're going to tell you how and why one startup is doing just that. Finally tonight, the coffee industry has a sustainability problem. Most of it is grown in certain latitudes around the world, and potential climate change is forcing farms to continually move higher, where there is less land. But one company has set out to solve that problem by taking the bean out of your morning cup of joe. Kate Rogers is in Seattle to see what the buzz is all about. Coffee, it's a ritual for many. The brewing of it, the taste, the smell. But one Seattle startup says it's figured out how to make a great cup of coffee without the bean. It's called molecular coffee. And if you're wondering why, you're not alone. Many people actually don't like the taste of coffee. You know, in fact, a lot of people add cream and sugar. 68% of people add cream and sugar to their coffee because they simply don't like the taste. And so one reason we thought, let's just make a better tasting cup of coffee. But really what's driving us is the whole deforestation and the long-term viability of coffee. Atomo, based in Seattle, not far from the famous Starbucks in Pike Place Market, was founded by friends Andy Kleinch and Jarrett Stopforth, who come from the tech startup and consumer packaged goods worlds. The two say they're coffee lovers, but know that coffee production as it stands today may not be sustainable. Most of it's grown in certain latitudes, and climate change will force farms to continually move higher where there's less land. So they've reversed engineered the coffee bean, making coffee from materials including sunflower seed husks and watermelon seeds. These are waste stream products that are normally discarded by farmers, and we take those ingredients and we find compounds in those ingredients that we can use in, to contribute to the flavor and the aroma and the body and the mouthfeel of coffee. So we're taking upcycled ingredients and naturally derived sustainable ingredients and using that as our base for our coffee. And yes, it does have caffeine. Give it a smell. The project began on Kickstarter, raising $25,000. Then the venture capital world came in with $2.6 million from Horizon Ventures, 
backer of Impossible Foods. And among Otomo's advisors is the CEO of Soylent, which makes plant-based meal replacements. It's not a fad. This is here to stay because we have to do it. We have to find uh, disruptive solutions to these, these issues that we're facing from a sustainability standpoint. Otomo plans to ship its first batch of cold brew to its Kickstarter investors this January as it continues working to get its coffee grounds right for hot brew. Otomo says the cold brew should be available at retailers mid-year. So we had to put the product to the test right here in Seattle up against another leading cold brew. Which one did you like better? This one. I like this one better. And the people liked it. Seven out of ten chose Otomo. No, amazing. I really like that. It's really good. Can I finish? This? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please. As it turns out, maybe the perfect cup of joe doesn't need a bean after all. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers in Seattle. Some of our staff tried that today, and they said yes. it was actually a little sweeter mm -hmm. than traditional coffee. But I'm not sure you need to even call it coffee if you're not using true. coffee beans. That's right? really true. Call it something else. Something else. We'll come up with a name. Yeah. Before we go, here's a look at the day's final numbers on Wall Street. The Dow rose 182 points to a record 27,674. The Nasdaq rose 23. S&P 500 added 8 for a record close as well. And on that note, that'll do it for us. we got to go get a cup of coffee. I'm yes. Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Or something else. Or something else. I'm Bill Griffith. <laughs> Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow.